There is a person that has been creative, impressive, and unique looking builds through the years. There is no doubt that he's one of the greatest builders of this YouTube era. But has he always built this way? Has he always been the artist he is today? And if not, when did it start? What secrets hide behind his craft? Hello everyone and welcome to Builders Research, a series where we will be analyzing the story and build style of different builders and creators. We will attempt to break down their process, style and techniques so that we can understand how they do what they do and how we can apply all that to our own creations. We will dive deeply into the story and builds of Vida Below 100 to see how he went from a house like this to an epic bridge like that. Today, we will uncover together the secrets behind Vida Below. Let's begin by going back 13 years. We can see here some of the first builds he created for his first series titled Building with Vida Below 100. And even though in terms of modern Minecraft building there is nothing impressive about them, it would be foolish for me not to point out the consistency and dedication put into it, given that this is the same series that 12 years later would give us amazing creations like this bridge. But when did it change? When did it go from this to that? Well, let's find out. I took the time to navigate through all of his Minecraft content and series over the years, trying to find the first trace of that artistic approach that characterizes Vidavelo's work nowadays. And although I found a few builds where I could say yes, this shows he has some skills, nothing, nothing answered or explained his improvement to me more than the following moment. This is episode one of Build School with B00. Now, I want to let you know first and foremost that I'm going to be more of like a student teacher, kind of. I had contacted Hypixel a while ago and just said, hey, I love the builds on your maps. Could you put me in touch with somebody that could kind of help me, help me kind of improve my style, help me build a little bit better. And he got me in touch with Gliss from M the Mithrinchia server. That build school series consists of a younger Vida Below building houses, interiors, and terrains alongside Gliss and learning from him. Sometimes, as builders, as creators, as players, as students, or even as professionals, we tend to do things individually on our own, and we can all identify with that at some point. So seeing that clip was eye-opening to me, because besides any techniques or style of build that Vida Below could show, that segment proves the essence of why he has been able to become who he is now. He recognized he could do better and reached out for help, and then shared what he learned in the form of a video. That is the core of Vida Below's content nowadays, always learning and trying different techniques to bring innovative things to the build scene without the fear of failure. So with this we can confirm something we already suspected. The amazing builds and style didn't appear overnight, instead it was a process that took years of practice, learning and changing. But still, what is it from his build style that nowadays everyone finds inspiring? When did we see it for the first time, and how can we break it down to understand better? Minecraft Season 3 happened in 2014, almost one year after the build school series we saw before. And here is where we can see, in a very small scale and with a very limited Minecraft, that big jump in the build style of Vida Below. Let's watch. The problem, which I anticipated, I knew this was coming, is that this roof is very plain and very boring. There's, there's several, multiple things that we can do to this roof to help add interest and help keep it looking cool. Uh, what we're going to do is try to spice it up a little bit. I'm, I'm having to kind of remember some of the instruction that I've got over time. I think my, my standards have kind of gone a little too high for myself. Good stuff takes some time. It takes some time to get the good stuff rolling. Those are clips from different episodes of that series, and I chose these as the first appearance of the modern Vidas for two reasons. First, because it's the first couple of times that he dedicated survival gameplay episodes to show and talk about the build and his building process, which we now know is something that he would carry on to do until today. 
and second because he was trying to, in his own words, spice it up a bit. And you can see in this cabin build how different his style was. Even with a very limited amount of blocks, he was mixing different colors, including a lot of details, and trying different things. He was definitely applying what he had learned from Gliss in the build school series a year before. Then of course, his builds kept improving over time, he joined Hermitcraft, and the builds grew in scale and style, leaving us with loads and loads of memorable builds in Season 7, Season 8, Season 9, and during the building with Vida Below series, the oldest series he carries on until this day. We now understand where he began and how over time he became such a unique builder. But in order to learn from his techniques, we must take a closer look and analyze some of his builds, break down the process in easy steps, and then create something of our own using that knowledge. Here we are in a flat world where I brought some of his builds. Of course, these are all from the Hermitcraft series because they are the only ones that I have access to download. Let's begin with the Moon's starter base from Season 8. This is a very memorable build and it has a lot of things going on. A half moon shape might look like a simple shape to make, but it's not. As with every rounded curve in Minecraft, it takes time to get them right. And on top of that, it is blended perfectly with the terrain underneath. Given the scale of this build and the level of details, I would guess the shape was done entirely or mostly by hand. Perhaps he assisted himself with some world edit commands to get a guide for the curves, but there's a lot of fine tweaking with walls, stairs and slabs, and that can't be done with commands. But the shape alone is not enough to sell the idea. The coloring, I would say, has the biggest responsibility for making this look the way it does. And to prove my point, let's do some quick changes with Axiom. So now we have the moon painted with white and behind a contrasting background. The top part is still very clear because of the shape, but what loses character is the bottom terraforming part. The shading in this area does a great job at incorporating darker colors to break down and fake the shape of the rocks. It helps to detach the moon from the terrain while making it look like the rocks are holding it. We could also take it a step further and add lighter grey colors to bring the rocks forward a bit more, but of course it's a starter base so I can understand why he wouldn't want to use concrete. And then we have the coloring of the moon itself, where he chose a mix of orange and green blocks to give it an oxidized copper feel, plus some brown and grey patches that look like oxidized iron or steel plates that were put in place to hold the build together. It's a very cool concept. To summarize, I would say the moon base uses every part of the build, coloring, detailing, shaping, and terraforming to sell the concept and tell the story of the build. We sometimes create a cool structure but no surroundings to help the build come together. Now let's move to the next one. This is one of the last builds from Season 7 of Hermitcraft. It's one of my favorites for many reasons, one of them being the fact that he used cyan and red tones to represent an oxidized copper roof back when copper was not introduced or announced to the game. And it works so well. There's a lot of small detailing done in every window which helps a lot with the gothic look of the castle. If we change it to white, we can still see a lot of the shapes already in place. The fact that we can still see the building when it's all a single color speaks for the amount of time and effort he probably put into the shaping of this castle. It is a very balanced build in my opinion, our attention always rests on the central part. Sometimes when building large structures it's easy to get carried away and build a large tower on one side or perhaps add some major asymmetry that can distract us from the centerpiece. So when building it's important to know where we want the focus of the build to be and make sure that we are not adding things around that distract our eyes from that. And that goes both for the shape and the coloring. In this case, I would also say that the orange towers on the sides do a great job at pointing our eyes into the circle in the middle. Sort of like in a diagonal way. Not sure if that was intentional, but it works. So to summarize, I would say it's a very detailed and balanced build, which is not easy to achieve, especially on a scale like this. Moving on to the Tree of Whimsy. This one is the original one, and these are two that I made myself trying to figure out what he did differently to make it look this good. And although I can't be 100% certain of the method he used, there are three things that I would say are key for this tree design. First of all, the shading of both the trunk and the leaves. The palettes he used are these ones going from darker to lighter. Understanding where you want your leaves to have a shadow darker color is not the same for every tree, but something simple you can do is put shadows in the bottom part or shadows right next to the branches. Second is the outer shape or contour of the tree. 
The tree of WMC has a very characteristic shape on the top, it's fluffier there while at the same time it's more open at the bottom leaving room and air so that we can see the shapes of the branches. Again, I can't be sure on the method but I would assume there's a lot of hand tweaking involved. And third, the styling on the leaves. I noticed there were some sort of horizontal lines in them that give a very interesting look to the tree. And a way to achieve that is to go to your tree, punch horizontal holes and pull horizontal lines in between. Kinda randomly. It takes some time, but in the end, the result is worth it. There are a lot of more things to talk about the making of a tree and the detailing, but those three are, in my opinion, the things that set this one apart from any classic tree design that you can achieve using tools like Axiom or Weld Edit, like I've shown in previous videos. Alright, let's skip the TNT shop for now because that is the most advanced one. And let's break down my favorite build of all, the big gate, or what I like to call it, the door. Let's begin by changing the color to white, like we did for the other builds, and you can see how this one in particular loses mostly every characteristic. That's because the focus of this build was not in the shape, but in the color. The concept was to play with contrast and different shadings of grey to give shape and detail to an almost flat surface. So now I want to try and do something similar following this concept and using the exact same palettes, going from acacia to deep slate to stone and light grey concrete for the walls, and for the door we have basalt, tuff and deep slate. But not only that, I also want to take some inspiration from the Season 7 castle shape, in particular the front face. So let's grab it and move it closer to the gate, and I will try to merge these two designs. Alright, let's begin with this. As we saw, without any colors, the shape was pretty simple, but it's important to get a similar dimension to give ourselves plenty of room to play with the different shadings. Then of course, because there's little to no shape, the parts where we do create real overhangs and divisions are very important because they will dictate and guide the rest of the building process. I will try to keep it as shallow as possible, not more than one or two blocks of depth. Now we need the towers on the sides, which are just some simple tall cylinders, and the last thing would be to place a circle here in the middle. Something like that. That's a good size, but I kinda want to move this to the top. Yep, yep, that works so much better. Let's carve a hole for a gate underneath, a line around it, and that should be the shape finished. It's simple, flat, and similar to the original one in shape and scale. I like it. Now for the painting part, we already have the palette selected for us. Let's first change the entire thing to stone, because I feel like that's the overall average color of the walls. Beginning with the towers, the design consists of having segments of the same size, going from lighter to darker colors. First, it has a line of light grey going all around, then we smooth the color a bit to the top, and right underneath we have a strong contrast with the darkest block of the palette. In this case, Deep Slate and Acacia. It's a bit random, but we just need to go around and repeat, trying to shift horizontally where the brightest greys are. That small segment already makes it look so different. And there we go, that's the first tower painted. So now let's do the second one. With both tower painted, we can start to see how the build is taking shape. Now for the circle, I will try and make it resemble this shape but only using grey color contrasts. So for that we will need some sort of lighter beams coming out of the middle. And then inside we need to make it dark. Let's use deep slate first to see if the contrast works for the shape. But now we can go and use some of the colors from the door and create a darker shade at the edges. We can even have a highlight at the very center. And for the lighter beams we can add some color variation to make it look like it's lighter on the top left side and darker towards the bottom right corner. And since the circle is supposed to be carved inside the wall, I would need to accentuate that by using the lighter colors around it. I know Vidas didn't use diorite in the original design, but I think here a small pop of white will help make this central circle pop out a bit more. There we go, I really like where this is going. Applying the same techniques, I took the time to shade the rest of the walls. Applying light colors to create overhangs and darker colors to create shadows and weathered areas like underneath the windows or close to the ground. On the top segment, I tried to make it resemble the window designs that we saw on the castle using the same techniques, and I think it turned out pretty good. Now we need to paint the door which has an overall darker palette using a very cool pattern with regular deep slate and cobble deep slate. So I will try to mix these blocks into something that looks decent. The original door has one block center, and ours has two block center. So we can use that to create a horizontal contrast with basalt and polished basalt. We can add some cross lines over here, 
And now let's fill the center with the same pattern he used because I like it, but maybe we can divide it in smaller segments with tuff. And it, it's not bad, so let's finish the rest. I feel like we need a big handle over here, and that's it. That's our take on the gate finished. It looks similar but different at the same time. I will say that mine doesn't look as impressive and that's probably because it's standing alone, so let's make some quick terraforming with Axiom. And this actually circles back to what we discussed in the moon base analysis. The surroundings of a build are very important. In this case, just with some simple terraforming, we managed to give this build a more finished and epic look. To compare, this is what it looked before painting and before the terraforming. This technique takes time, but it's very powerful and fun to play around with. And what's interesting about this technique is that it has two advantages. The first one is that we did this using a grayscale, which I find simpler to use than any other color palette. But still, we can then replace this with any other one. We just need to find the equivalence in terms of brightness or saturation. For instance, we can use this orange one and get this very different effect that should work decently well and still preserve the shape. And the second advantage is that because it's mostly flat, we can rotate the build 45 degrees and the shapes done with the shading should remain on the build. And that's it for the door, let me know what you think about it. But now let's move to the last and most complex one of the builds, the TNT shop. Out of the 5 builds we are analyzing, I consider this one to be the most complex one for the simple reason that it combines different techniques. So let's break it down. First of all, it uses a gradient color palette, going from nether bricks all the way to the cyan and green, with copper and bamboo. Then he uses a second color palette, going from pink and magenta to prismarine. And what Bidabs does with this is very interesting. He is simulating a magenta neon light over here, and it consists of changing the color of the blocks around it to cast a light on the wall. The opposite of what we did for the door, which were mostly shadows with the extra difficulty that this time is not a grayscale, so he had to take into consideration how a magenta light would look over a cyan surface, using color blending. Here, for instance, in this image, we can see how a magenta light would mix over a cyan light, to create a wide saturated tone, and I think that's kinda the idea of what he did right here, desaturating the color of the wall with smooth stone and then slowly transitioning back to the cyan. Then apart from the color work done in this, which is impressive, there's a lot of detailing going on, using glass paints to change the colors where needed, and adding fences and trapdoors to create cool looking windows and overhangs. But even though we have all those details going on, the top of the build is the one that catches our attention. The contrast of the color works really well here, but to make it look good, getting the shape right is very important. And for that, the election of nether bricks is clever because it allowed BDAVs to use every different size of blocks, from slabs to fences, walls, and even dark oak trapdoors and chains. Overall, it creates a very industrial vibe, and the fact that it's all dark allows him to layer blocks on the back and front to create interesting shapes that from a distance you can't really tell that they are separated. But enough talking, let's do something with this to understand it better. I decided to grab the monolith build from season 9 and repaint it using these techniques. After removing the vegetation, I slowly painted the monolith from cyan at the bottom to the dark nether brick at the top. There is not much to say here other than just be patient, and if you are practicing painting a build with a gradient, I would recommend you do it manually at least once or twice to understand how blocks work as colors and how they blend together. Then you can assist yourself with tools like Axiom and World Edit, but doing it manually at least once really helps getting a better grasp on the idea. There we go. Now I even added the magenta neon light over there using the color blending concept, and I think it works out pretty well. We can also try here with the yellow one, which is very similar, and um, yeah, the result looks cool. Now I will go ahead and add some of that industrial shaping with the different nether brick variants, trying my best to use the different layers of depth to get the shapes that I want. And that's it, that's the result if the monolith was painted with the TNT shop build technique. One last thing, here I played around a bit more with the concept of having lights on top of surfaces and color blending, and something very interesting is that you can really play around with the shape of the light casted to get a completely different look for instance. But something very important to consider is that these effects work better from a distance, as you can see here, but in any case, they are very fun to play around with regardless. To conclude this first research, I will say that Vida Below has a great and vast catalogue of videos and builds to learn from. 
They are very varied and as we stated at the beginning, the consistency, the dedication and the constant search of innovative techniques are what makes him and his content one of the best out there. Of course, there are a lot of other more recent builds that we didn't get to analyze, like the ones from Season 10 or from his building with Vida Velo series, I would have loved to, but I decided to stick to the ones that I could look from up close. Perhaps in the future we will get to see the other ones. For now, this is going to be everything. I honestly learned a lot doing this and I hope you also did by watching the video. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, and let me know in the comments if there's any builder that I should do my research on next. Thank you so very much and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.